Hi, this is Stephen Greif, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio. Goodbye, Villa. And thank you. Anytime. I'll remember that. Oh, will you? G'day audiophiles, you're listening to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and sometimes Blake 7 and sometimes other things too, but today Blake 7 uh, in the audio medium. My name is Dwayne. And my name is Philip. G'day audiophiles, g'day Dwayne. Philip, how are you? I am going slowly insane, but I'm fine, thank you. We um, had a fantastic instalment last week talking with Sally Navette, where we're checking off the uh, chats with Blake 7 members uh, off your bucket list, Philip? We are. Still a couple more to go, but yeah, looking good. <laughs> looking very good. Um, so in, instead of jumping down the rabbit hole this week, I thought we'd have a have a read through some of the comments that we've got. We've got a couple of comments, not just from last week's episode, but from uh, previous episodes as well that I'd like to go through. Just instead of uh, jumping down the rabbit hole, just for a change, what do you think? I think it's a great idea. It's been lovely having some people giving us feedback, and it's yeah, good yes. to share with you. Yes, thank you so much. A lot of it comes from our YouTube channel, so uh, either our YouTube channel or our socials, wherever it comes from, we're happy to uh, receive it. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, so first up, uh, a couple of comments from um, our YouTube channel, uh, from the Sally Navette interview that we uh, that we posted uh last week uh steve foster says what a wonderful interview i've always adored sally a very frank honest talented and likable actress of course blake seven introduced me to her and despite her misgivings she was absolutely dynamite in the role and much missed after she left despite the brilliance of josette simon as her replacement dana i could listen to her talk about her life for hours and in fact, he did, because it went for a couple of hours, that interview. Uh, this is a woman who really lived life her way. I have 100% love, respect, and admiration for her. Thank you, Steve. That was awesome. Andrew Wilson uh, on the same thread says, Sally still looks amazing. I listened to the audio on Friday. I had no idea. It was nearly two hours long. I was completely engaged. So, um, yeah, thanks thanks for that feedback on, on Sally's interview. It was a, a pleasure for us. And one of the hard things for us is when, when people like to talk to us. With my, with my background in, in radio, sometimes I think maybe we should cut that out and make it into a more manageable size. But uh, f judging from those um, comments there, Philip, uh, I don't think that was necessary in Sally's case. That's for sure. Everyone loved listening to her. I agree. If people, want to, you know, people can always jump forward themselves, or people can play it faster. It's, it's good. It's going to give a nice rounded picture of the whole life. And you know, Sally, you know, Sally gave us everything from her whole childhood up to what she was doing right now and her passions. So yeah, I think it was a great interview. I had fun. So if you haven't heard that yet, jump back and give it a listen. It's fantastic. I don't know anything about Emma Dale, and I had no idea that she, in that series, was was married to Fraser Hines' character. So that that was new for me. Well, I knew that. Yeah, I knew they were married. It was. Not, I never watched Emma Dale, but I mean, I followed Fraser's career quite extensively. Of course, he was in Emma Dale for I don't know many many years, and one of his great peeves is the fact that you know, he was his major character in the you know the major plot line for more than a decade, maybe two decades, and then he got killed off screen. But he would have come back and done it if they'd asked him. But yeah, he, the two of them were quite good together. All right, so let's have a look at um, another piece of feedback. Oh, this time from the week before, some of our reviews from June to August. Uh, we got um, a comment from Andy Frankham Allen. He was the author of, well, he is the author of The Secrets of Debt Sen. He said, thank you for the kind words about Secrets of Debt Sen. Pick of the month, because I said that was my pick of the month, and it certainly is. He was chuffed about that. Um, I also was under the impression he did some countermeasures in the back of my mind, and he said, uh, um, well, I said to him, I hope you can write some more for Big Finish, um, hoping to 
get some dirt out of him and he provided a little bit of dirt he said i dare say i shall early uh, more early adventures hopefully and uh, and yep uh, new adventures and some short trips so i don't remember the short trips that andy did but yeah certainly there was a countermeasures that featured the yeti and uh and andy was involved with that one so thank you for that andy looking forward to more of your early adventures that's for sure now let's move on to a little bit longer feedback um this is for uh, or from a listener that goes by the name of HG Wells 1899. Well, he's not just a listener, he's a viewer. So he comments regularly on our YouTube channel. And can I just say HG Wells 1899, whatever your real name is, thank you so much for all the comments. It's, it's really thrilling to get this kind of engagement from our audience. Even though we do this because we love it, um, it's always nice to get this kind of positive uh, feedback as well. HG Wells is uh, commenting on the reviews episode that we did. Says he couldn't agree more with the comments. Re the War Doctor begins. Respond to all calls. Great, great stuff. And damn it, now I'm intrigued by that War Master set. Despite originally giving it a hard pass, deciding I'm so over it. And Detsen will indeed have to wait for a sale, but now it's on the wish list. Thanks to yourself and the and the never predictable always bringing much to the table mr philip uh don't let any post jab post restriction freedom fool you guys when it finally arrives stay safe always so yeah we're sort of in the midst of our um uh, vaccination programs here in australia so um so he's commenting on that uh he says can't wait to listen to that susan audio soon been keeping it on the back burner for when i need some proper doctor who a weird way to think of a completely doctorless story perhaps so that 60s sound design idea has me again super intrigued so there you go you, there was something you picked up on philip and shared uh in that episode that the sound design for after the daleks was uh really harking back to the 60s and and uh, H.G. Wells 1899 picked up on that. Yeah, well, it's, it sounds like the studio set to me, like the, the set of in the uh, Dark Invasion of Earth. They've got, they've got that sound running through it. Yes, uh, he goes on. If I could add one recent audio to the list of positives, he continues. For me, it would be Empire of Shadows. I'm really not a Torchwood guy at all, but the far future setting, the standout cinematic sound design by Naomi Clark, and a charismatic turn from Sean quote suddenly next doctor material parks made a small story unexpectedly huge can't wait for more from zachary cross flane and indeed all the individual torchwood archive satan pit crew if that's where this is going and on the basis of this it really should lastly trying and failing to keep this brief that war master howl theme outro rocked nice one I don't know if you picked up on that that i slipped that in there philip but um i really like that uh howl uh uh, mashup theme uh, for the War Doctor that was uh, on the end of our last episode. Bet you haven't even listened to it. I haven't listened to the end. There sorry. you go. There you go. I knew you wouldn't have. I knew it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I haven't had a chance to. I've, I've fallen slightly behind on my Torchwoods, and I, the last one I heard was Madam I'm from. Was it two months ago? There's, yeah, that was a month before last. I haven't listened to Madam I'm, but I have listened to this Torchwood. Oh, right, the Empire right. Shadows. And do you agree with the comments? It is brilliant. Like, right. yes, it, it's it's just that whole world building of that bit of the universe and that time stream and the emperor and Torchwood being called in, but why? Um, yeah, it's really well written. I was really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, Sean is amazing in it. Cool. Um, thank you so much, uh, HG Wells 1899. We haven't heard the last of him. I'm going to read another even longer comment from him in a moment, but let's go to another one. This one is from a poster on YouTube called Hero Hammer Studios. Check out his channel if you get a chance. Um, what was he talking about? Oh, this was a, a comment in, in relation to the Brave New Town episode we did long, long time ago. I've been slowly uh, posting those, epi those older episodes up on our YouTube channel. And so Hero Hammer Studios has heard this episode for the first time and he's commenting on Brave New Town. He says, I always liked the new themes, uh, specifically because they helped to better differenti differentiate between the different eras. And I think that's where I was expressing my unhappiness that the Eighth Doctor theme changed a lot, uh, and particularly with the Lucy Miller theme. Um, that way, in my mind at least, they didn't have to compete with the Charlie era because it presented more as its own new thing. 
that's one part that really bothered me about Dark Eyes Onwards. They sort of sour the original run for me as I'm not as fond of the later stuff and it becomes difficult to separate the eras and give them a proper chance to stand on their own. This is probably just me being silly, but I hope you see where I'm coming from. Yes, I do. I do see where you're coming from. Um, and I, I, I do understand what you're saying, Hero Hammer. Also, you especially, Dwayne, seemed a little negative on this. Me? Negative? What? I find that really hard to believe, Dwayne, that you'd ever be negative. <laughs> uh, but I love how Pandorica Opens uses the Brave New Town style Autons. To be fair, uh, that's probably just because I have a huge soft spot for continuity and references to older stories. And I know how Moffat is a big Finnish fan. So I don't remember what my negativity was about that at the time. Uh, because, yeah, I don't remember. But anyway, I probably would have been if they didn't use the spearhead from Space Autons, because I think nothing beats those. So uh, thank you so much for the, your comment on that, Hero Hammer Studios. All right, so this is H.G. Wells, 1899, with, um, with a, uh, an exceptionally long comment. I think this is a post that he uh, posted on The Wrong Doctors. Do you remember we reviewed that a long time ago? I was out on the road, Philip, and... Uh, we, we recorded that episode. We we're having difficulties recording it, but we got it out there and yeah. we talked about the wrong doctors. It's a great episode. Mm. Yeah. This is what HG Wells 1899 has to say. This here was my first ever big finish about three years ago. So not long ago. And by coincidence, the one I re-listened to after hearing the super Matt Fitton origin story on the big finish podcast last weekend. Now some 300 plus downloads in. Oh, you've got a long way to go. Uh, not counting podcasts or freebies, clearly I'm in need of an intervention. Uh, I know where you're coming from. But looking back, I remember The Wrong Doctors as quaint first time round, and hardly the audio which blew me away and sealed my fate that was the next listen, the possible, uh, the, the apocalypse element. Re-listen confirm the quaintness, and how I miss Miss Mel's screaming from the TV show. I've got to say, I don't. Okay, that sounds weird. Yes, it does. However, parts one to three, while interesting, were not quite the perfect fitten I recognise from later audios. But of course, how could it be? I suppose this very early story by an earlier version of uh, Big Finish MVP. What's MPV stand for? Not sure. No idea. And then part four, and wow, what a difference a decent finale makes. I think the redoubtable Mr. F works best when he's handed a prescribed selection of toys from the sandbox and told, go play. Uh, it's why he's often the Kickstarter of a new range. He's like the Mr. T of Big Finish, A-Team. Shut him away with nothing but a limited scrap heap of spare story parts, a mission statement from the man with the cigar. I think that's David Richardson. Uh, de detailing a particular beat or two, he wants hammered out on the anvil a metaphorical blowtorch and a very real deadline, and soon enough, uh, B.A. Fitton will bust the hell out behind the wheel of the supercharged vehicle of your Doctor Who dream and blow the opposition to smithereens every time. Is that the TV? Is that the opposition? Could be. Uh, which it turns out is exactly what he does here with part four of The Wrong Doctors. But this time, it's all the disparate elements of his own making which go into the build. An early demonstration of the customising skills he's honed over all the years and the stories since. It was uh, there all along. Pity the fool who doubted it. Part 4 was pure MF, barnstorming away. Every thread tied up, yet paying off perfectly. Each interaction sparking that classic inventiveness and, that, and just the completeness of his storytelling. The knockout punch the earlier rounds had been missing. I finished the thing in awe as ever. A confirmed fit and fanboy for life, in case you couldn't tell. I love it when a paradox comes together. Uh, so, that's another comment then, another excellent podcast. Maybe it goes without saying, in my humble opinion, you blokes are seriously undersubscribed. How am I the only commenter here, and how do I keep getting away with it? I'm not going to stop you. Uh, but you remind me that this fandom business can be positive if that's how we treat the show and the fellow fans. Is the message... Uh, it's the message I take away every time. So thanks both for that. Uh, by the way, feel free to ignore my ramblings. Stay safe and keep on rocking. Uh, I'm not going to ignore your ramblings. Uh, HG Wells 1899. That was an awesome comment. And uh, thank you so much for... Do you think he likes Matt Fitton, Philip? I think he does. Just I, I get that slight impression. 
I get that slight impression. Well, I think he's very positive, like we'd like to be too, as positive as you can be. Yeah, or absolutely. Don't, or don't say much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for that. Shall we have uh, another one? Let me just see what's next. Okay, so on the socials recently, I threw out the question, throw us the story you'd like to see, on, uh, see us do a deep dive review on. So I thought I'd put it to the listeners to see what kind of feedback we got. Um, and we got some there. Matthew Burns says, uh, Eccleston box sets. Well, we did that uh, in our last review show. Uh, Jameson Glass uh, says, oh, so many, to, so many to choose from. The War Doctor, including The War Doctor Begins, Gallifrey, The War Master series, Eighth Doctor stories. You could split them into three. You Main Range, Lucy, and uh, the box sets. A uh, lot to choose from. Uh, Roddy McDougal. I'd really like to, if possible do roddy mcdougall's uh suggestion he does classic doctors new monsters volumes one and two i'd love to do those at some point because uh i'd like to do it for roddy because he's been such a loyal listener for for such a long time thanks roddy for your for continuing to listen so i'd love to do that one uh Stu gutteridge says uh sapphire and steel and the tomorrow people so there are a couple of ranges that uh no longer available from big finish but yes i would definitely love to do some deep diving into those what about you philip yes definitely and um of course you know, announced on monday was the fact that we're getting the second season of christopher eccleston about to be of released course. so that's pretty exciting that we, we you know another i think it was 16 stories coming is that what they said was it that many i'm, I'm pretty sure it's four box sets okay so I, maybe it may only be 12 depends how I, many I, put in a box at, set. at the time of recording i didn't see that i didn't look at the numbers i just saw that it was the the uh the run was going through next year into the year after so into 2023 so yeah. we've got and lots that, and lots of ninth doctor to, to coming up so that's going to be very exciting and the lovely thing was just the positive comments that christopher eccleston made about how much he enjoyed going in studio playing the doctor again and in some ways feeling rejuvenated by the part yeah because of what big finish has done so once yeah. again Big Finish has brought what was a unpleasant experience and made it nice again. Oh, there's an interesting one from Jam Jameson. Uh, said maybe do Doctor Who and the Pirates with an interview with Jack Jack Rayner. That would be good. Oh, well, I would um, love to. That's one of my favourite stories. You know that. And then the rest of the comments uh, for Tomorrow People. Aaron Climus, uh, he he likes Tomorrow People as well. So, yeah, would really like to would really like to do that. Absolutely. Um, I think there was one more on the Twitter feed. Oh, Hero Hammer Studios um, suggested Memory Lane with the Eighth Doctor Charlie and Keras as his favourite. And I said the closest we got was uh, the closest we got to that was Scaredy Cat recently, which was not the best, not the best story in the world. But despite that, which I'd still go back into any of those stories around that time. Very, very good stuff. So um, thanks everyone for all that feedback. Um, Instead of, this is this is a Randomoids episode, so we're, we are going to be looking at something that the Randomoids Selectatron picked for us last episode, which is Blake 7, The Liberator Chronicles Volume 3. But instead of uh, going back to the randomizer this time, you can if you're looking on YouTube, you can see a TARDIS cookie jar behind me, and I've put all those suggestions into the cookie jar. And at the end of this review, I'm going to pull out a random selection as selected by you, our listeners and viewers. So, uh, and then we'll go and uh, do that for our next uh, Randomoids episode. So just uh, just do that for a bit of a change. What do you think, Philip? I think that sounds like a lot of fun. All right. Let's go into uh, the Liberator Chronicles. And here is a trailer for Volume 3, The Armageddon Storm. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Blake 7. The Armageddon Storm. Shorin burned. My name is Kelly, a member of the Rebellion. For several weeks, I've been working with the Resistance Movement here on Shorin. Del Grunt, mercenary. The Resistance discovered that the Federation Science Corps has been working on a new super weapon, known only as PDX-10. So, what's our next move? Where do we start looking for this PDX-10 thing? I mean, the sooner we find it and disarm it, the sooner we can safely be away. Well, according to the intel, Shorin is the likely target for a full test detonation. Our planet Shorin has been devastated by a new weapon developed by the Federation. Data scrawled across the view screen. Data logs and vid records of the PDX-10. It's as if the planet has been turned 
inside out. We watched in silence, the true horror of the Armageddon storm unfolding before us. Grant's weapon, it's real all right. PDX-10 ready for planet-wide testing. No hope of escape. And the sky above us burned. Subscribers get more from BigFinish.com. Okay, so Philip, you were very excited that this uh, came up uh, on our last Randomoids episode and sort of very serendipitous, isn't it? That it seemed to fall right in the middle of uh, a bunch of chats with Blake Seven people. So it's worked out quite nicely, hasn't it? Things just seem to happen the right way when we uh, start looking, which is great. Yeah. Um, so the Armageddon Storm is a single story. Uh, before we get into the details of the story, tell us a bit about chronicles and how how they work for those who haven't heard the chronicle stories of either, either blake seven or doctor who what uh, they're, they're some of your favorite ranges and i've got to say whenever i dip into them too i i love them too but explain to us what they are in comparison to audiobooks or full cast yeah i'd love to so chronicles started with the companion chronicles so uh gary russell his policy was not to recast actors who passed away which meant there was no room for any of the first three Doctors to have stories. And of course, for a long, long time, Tom Baker wasn't prepared to come back to the role, which actually meant that we had all these actors and actresses who play companions across 30 years of Doctor Who who had no role to play in Big Finish. So Gary Russell did start employing a lot of them in other parts, and we've talked about some of them as, uh, along the way as different stories have come up. But I think he realised, and people kept pushing them for the fact that, the, that they really wanted to see these actors come back and play roles. And so for that reason, Companion Chronicles started. So the Doctor Who Companion Chronicles, and they started writing stories for these companions, which were told basically as narratives, perhaps as two-handers, where a companion would tell a story about their time with the Doctor. And they proved to be more and more popular. Um, eventually, there was actually a couple of years where there was one coming out every single month. So I think the first two seasons, there was just four in the series. And those were so successful that they started bringing out monthly for a number of years and became more and more creative in the stories that they started to tell. Um, for some bizarre reason, I still don't understand why, why uh, they decided to end the Companion Chronicles because I still think they were being the most inventive that they were. But at the same sort of time, there was a big push to get Blake Seven back on to big, to, big, to big finish. But once again, the issue with Blake Seven particularly was the cast had to be so huge that to do a full audio drama, you're looking at six cast members in the main cast, plus one or two villains in Travis and Serverland, plus guest cast, that that becomes a mammoth expense. And big finish just didn't want to go there. For Blake Seven, they didn't know how successful it would be. They didn't know what the audience would be like. And so they decided to go down the same track that they had with Doctor Who and just start with Liberator Chronicles. Well, the, the first full cast that Blake Seven did was called Warship, wasn't it? That's right. What, did, was that before the Blake, uh, the Liberator Chronicles? or did that No, come that, after? That, that was about five seasons in. Right, right, right. So there have been lots of box sets first. Um, and originally they, they started off with Gareth, they got um, Gareth Thomas... Um, Paul Darrow, Michael Keating were the, in the first box set. That was they were joined by Jan Chapel and Jacqueline Pierce in the second box set. And both those two box sets proved to be hugely successful. And as Big Finish does, they decided to start getting a bit more creative. And so with the third box set, they decided to go with a single story for across the three, the whole box set. So one large story with with a cast of once again only four people. Um, plus, I don't know, Alistair Locke, who's, the, who's doing the sound design at this stage, started playing um, Orak and Zen. So you actually had another character there. He doesn't get credited as such, though, in, at this point. He will later. Um, and so you then had this third box set. And it's, it's actually much more of a complete story. And you wouldn't actually know very much to narrate it. The narration is very soft narration. It's a lot more played out with a lot more dialogue between the cast members. And so it actually feels like the first full cast audio drama you have a Blake seven so um I'll, let me just let me just read the the blurb uh on the story itself so because 
even though we've got four cast members throughout the set on this, uh, there is the return of a character that um, uh, from the TV series that was very exciting. It was written by Mark Wright and Kevin Scott, who uh, also created uh, Forge. The, the Forge. Mm. We were just talking about that recently with Rob from the Doctor Who show. Uh, and the blurb says, Del Grant, mercenary, Kerr Avon, freedom fighter, former friends, former enemies, linked forever thanks to, to Grant's sister, or Grant, I should say, uh, the woman Avon loved, the woman Avon killed, now their paths cross again. Grant has learned of the existence of the Armageddon Storm, a terrifying new Federation superweapon. Avon finds himself in a race against time with his crew's lives hanging in the balance. But what will Grant do when he finds out about the blood on Avon's hands? So to get the setting of this uh, chronologically, so uh, Del Grant is, well, let's talk about who it's played by. First of all, uh, Tom Chadbon plays Del Grant, who uh, Doctor Who fans will know from City of Death. He played Duggan. So if you're not a fan of Blake Seven, you'll know uh, the actor, uh, Tom Chadbon from City of Death. Um, he he had been doing Big Finish for quite a few years because I think uh, I think he may have first appeared for Big Finish as uh, Harry Sullivan's brother in the yeah, Sarah, Sarah Jane, Jane Smith that's stories. Right. In the second season, he's Harry's brother. Yep. Yeah. So uh, he was playing a very interesting character there, which which makes me think if Tom Chadbon was willing to be recording with Big Finish all those years ago, we've missed a golden opportunity for a Duggan spin-off. Did anyone at Big Finish ever think of that? I'd love to get into Jason's ear at some point and say, did was a Duggan series ever uh, considered? Uh, because I think Tom Chadbon, and he's got such a great voice for audio as well. It's just, to, to hear him and Paul Darrow together is just like, it's like golden honey uh, in the ears uh, as far as listening to those two uh, on audio. So, but chronologically, this would be set sometime after Rumours of Death, which was a later episode from Series 3, uh, because uh, by that stage... Um, as by as the as stage... I was going to say, yeah, yeah, there's, there's two important Blake 7 episodes. In, yes. Once again, if you have to be fans to know, mm -hmm. uh, so the first one would be uh, Counterpoint. Is yep. that right? Yep, that's Series 2, Episode 9, isn't it? Oh, well done, yes. <laughs> yeah, which is the first <laughs> time we actually meet. And that's, that's how we discover about Anna Grant... We find out about um, her and Avon, him being in love. At that time, we think it was a lovely love story that she was picked up and murdered by the Federation, how evil. Yeah. Um, and so certainly at that point, Avon and him are quite enemies and they have a, yeah, the whole scene is in ice, slowly collapsing, trying to save a planet from a weapon of mass destruction. So that's that's the first story. And then Rumours of Death, as you've mentioned, uh, Anna Grant is actually alive and well and was actually the one who betrayed Avon. And so you've got this knowledge that is playing throughout in terms of will Avon tell his tell Grant about his sister and what she was really like. Yeah. Ultimately, well, obviously the blurb indicates that the that the that the truth does come out. So how's Grant going to deal with that? And we find that out through the story. But the way the story is done is uh, it, it's it's a three a, a three act play basically. So in the first act, we've got Del Grant coming in. Um, and, and so basically the first and last episodes are mainly Paul Darrow and Tom Chadbon. Were, uh, were the first two in the first episode? I can't remember. Yes, they, yes, they are. So, yeah, the, first, so all, the first 10 yeah. or 15 minutes is all four of them, the whole working out what's going on, finding out about the weapon of mass destruction. And then Callie and, and Villa teleport down to the planet while the rest of the crew go off to find out more information. In fact, story one and story two are taking place at exactly the same time. Yeah, and so it's a, one of the clever things that that the writers have done is to you, you get to the end of story one with this big cliffhanger. You hear Villa and Callie trying communicating with the Liberator, and everything's going to hell, literally. And yeah, it it's, it appears that they've died in this massive uh, activation of this uh, Armageddon storm weapon that they're trying to uh, get information on and um, and stop from deploying. And then, and then the, 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 the second story runs the, parallel with the whole first story and ends at the same point as the first episode does. So you've got both first for part one, part two, both finish identically, but, yeah. but from different points of view, one from Avon's point of view, one from Callie and Bill's point of view. 
Yeah, so we've got Michael Keating and Jan Chappell in in the second episode. That's their that's their story, uh, which I thought was interesting too because they were able to drop Michael Keating's voice and add an extra character that they could converse with. Because with the Chronicles, you get you they're very interesting because you get a lot of internal monologue when it comes to the narration. So you get to know. That's what I like about the Chronicle stories is that you get to get inside the characters more than you would in a full cast audio. Um, but yeah, by lowering Michael Keating's voice, they were able to get that, uh, that uh, re- resistance leader. Um, and well, it's, set- a, it's a voice we've heard Michael Keating use in one of the diversion stories when Michael Keating comes into uh, with, with Paul. And I forget, I forget which one it is. I'm trying to remember well, which, which diversion story is he in. Well, he wasn't with, I don't think he was, I don't think he was with Paul. He was in the Twilight Kingdom. That was the the last story from the first season of Divergent Universe. Oh, okay, that was, yeah, that that was Keating, and then yes. Paul Paul Darrow was in the the final episode of the la, of the second Divergent series. Oh yes, sorry, that's right. Um, yes, but I forgive you. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I was trying to think McGann's first name. To be perfectly honest, that's what's throwing me. Um, what's McGann's first name? Paul. Paul, that's the Paul I was talking about. Well, I was talking about Darrow. Oh, Darrow. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. We're talking Blake Seven. I'm not thinking about Doctor Who. Uh, Come on. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So with the eighth Doctor, <laughs> Michael Keating appears in, it's the Twilight Kingdom. That's the story I forgot. And that's the voice he uses in the Twilight Kingdom. Yeah. Because when I first knew that Michael Keating was in the Twilight Kingdom, I didn't pick him because he's not using his normal villa voice. He's using this very authoritative low voice, which is the, the similar voice to what he uses in the Chronicles. And it, he pl- it talks to himself and it plays really well. Because it's very hard to it's Michael Keating, so it, it creates another character for the for the story. Mm. And I love the you, you you get with these with these chronicles, you get a, a much deeper insight into the relationship between all the characters, particularly Avon and and Villa, and how and particularly how Avon feels about Villa. I thought that was really nice as well um, to get into that, but. Apart from that, you've got this really this really good story as well, and they t- with the sound design, they take you right into that into that universe, and uh, I can't recommend the Chronicle stories highly enough. To be honest, they're just uh, sensational. Yeah, fully agree. I mean, you, you've got all sorts of things. I mean, you've got the whole idea of weapons of mass destruction, and of course, this is, I think this came out in two thousand and thirteen, so it's a good ten years after the. Um, Iraq invasion for such for weapons of mass destruction, which didn't exist. Yeah, it's interesting because the whole thing is fairly skeptical to start with in terms of is there really a, a weapon of mass destruction? And the assumption is, of course, it's on the planet, which is how Counterpoint worked. That the, the Federation had created a kind of weapon to destroy the planet, but you assume that you'll have the same ending as you had with Counterpoint, which is that you know the crew rescue everything, whereas this one it doesn't work that way. Mm. Um, so that's interesting. There's a, there's a bit of body horror stuff in it in terms of experimentation, in terms of the the force, because you've got a planet that's in rebellion, and you've got Servalan, who's not actually in this, but her presence is felt in terms of her evil, um, and just the whole idea of, of the fear of the unlike. How do we deal with people who aren't like us, and, and what do we do do in those cases? And that's part of the one of the themes that comes up uh, throughout this as well. Okay. Well, there you go. Who who else can I can we talk about in relation to this? Um, Alistair Locke did the music. You've already mentioned him. So, Alistair's been around for a long time. He was he was involved with the Caldor City series. He was involved with BBV. Um, so yeah, he's he's dabbled in the worlds of Blake Seven for a long time. And I think I think he does a he goes on to do a very good um, uh, Zen and Orac channels Peter Tudnam very well. Um, so he's good there. Uh, I, I just want to see, once again, just sing the praise of both Carbon Scott and Mark Wright in terms of their writing. Um, I, I, we need to get them on at some point because I'd love to know how they actually do the process because it's, it's a hard for uh, people to work together often in terms of working on how they write. So I'd love to know, does one storyline or one dialogue or do they take it in turns to write pages? And then, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they do it. So at some stage, we'd love to have them on just to talk a bit more because all the stories they do have a depth to them, often a double edge in terms of there's a darkness behind them that you're not quite expecting. Something can seem quite light and easy, 
but I do think they capture the characters' voices, and you know, Avon gets his very, and even Villa, they both get their their funny lines and their their powerful lines in there. And I'd also just like to mention um, Ken Bentley again as director. Uh, he's you know he's great with getting things done on time. He's great with in terms of usually the big stories in terms of multicasts, but he actually manages to work really well with the small cast because often it's, it's more often than not someone like Lisa Bowman or some of them who do more of the chronicles. Um, Ken hasn't done a lot of chronicles, but I think this continuous story, he really gets the idea of epicness through and you know, holds it all together with the cast. Can I just say, for anyone who may be listening or watching and or still watching at this point and having, have never seen the Blake 7 TV series before or heard any Big Finish audio, um, one thing that Big Finish did for me uh, in recent years was uh, Callan. I'd never seen the TV series Callan before, uh, but I like Ben Miles, so I jumped in and, and uh, had a listen to their rendition of Callan. Uh, when it came out and i ended up going back on the basis of that going back and buying all the all the callan dvds with edward woodward and i'm i'm still going through them and it was because of big finish that uh, that they got me into it uh, that's that's the quality of their stories they're so good and for anyone who thinks oh, i can't listen to blake seven because i've never heard uh seen the tv series don't let that stop you because um the, the the characters are what Blake Seven is all about, and you'll get these in the audios just as much, if not more. And you will be going back and delving into the TV series after you hear these. Let me assure you. Yeah, I mean, what Big Finish does is people who know the series well, they'll pick up on all sorts of clues and ideas and love it because yeah. it's there. But for people who don't know, you don't need to. Um, my experience with that with Big Finish is Survivors. I'd never watched the episode of Survivors. This is the first couple of box sets. I've now watched all four seasons. Of the TV show, the first two are excellent. Season three and four, yeah. But the uh, the big finish stuff is much better. Um, once again, and yeah, but yes, the big finish is nasty. Costs me lots of money. <laughs> uh, very good. All right, shall we leave it there? Because we're not going to go on too long today. Because we had lots of feedback, and we've been we've been talking for a little while now. Shall we? Shall we have a look and see what we're going to do next time? Yes, I'm excited to see what's going to come out. Let's now. let's get the cookie jar. All right. My little TARDIS cookie jar. Doesn't work anymore. I need to replace the battery. The battery's gone flat. Let's see if I can... All right. I've got one. We're just choosing one, are we? Choose one this time and we can pick another one next time. Okay. What do you say? Yep. All right. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is... Okay. Got that? Ah, oh, yes, I do. Okay. Sapphire and Steel. We're going to be having a look at Sapphire and Steel. So this is stuff that you can only get if you buy it secondhand. Um, so as to what we might... have, How much Sapphire and Steel have you heard, Philip? I have a lot of it. I haven't listened to any of it. I don't really? Think, I've, I've only ever watched the first TV show, the first story in the Sapphire and Steel. I, I recently watched that on YouTube. Uh, and I was planning to get into because I sort of managed to pick up secondhand a number of Safan Steel stories, but they've been sitting there to listen to. You've got to, um, you've got to get past that first Sapphire and Steel story uh, on, on TV. Television. Yes. Oh, I, I didn't. You, you've got to, yeah, you've got <laughs> they to. Do, they do get better than do they? Yeah, <laughs> that was, it was very slow, like really oh, slow. Oh, the second one's very slow too because that's uh, eight episodes. The second one. Okay. Uh, but they sort of. Uh, get get a bit shorter in length uh, as as the years go on, uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Once you get past the first couple, although people love that second story, that eight, eight episode story, but I, I find it difficult too. Okay. I've got to be I've got to be in the mood to get into that one. However, the uh, big finish Sapphire and Steels they usually don't go for any longer than two discs. So okay. are there big any particular stories we're going to choose, or we're just going to try and look at the whole gamut? Um, well, they're, they're in seasons, so why don't we uh, try and put up some polls on oh, the, okay. and see what our list, seeing it was a listener suggestion, let's see what the listeners think we should listen to. Um, I love Joe Lidster's uh, Sapphire and Steels, actually, and he's done a, a few of those. Nigel Fairs has done a few. That's going to be very exciting. I'm, I'm glad I picked that one. Okay. It, although it does seem a bit scary because it's a, a quite quite a lot of stories. So how do we break it down into into the story that we want to actually listen to? 
uh, or two. We'll listen to two. So I'll put up some polls and see if we can get that sorted by the by the next time we do it. Um, so, uh, Philip, have you got mm. any recommendations that you can uh, give us this time? I am. I'm going to give you something that's gone back to my childhood and something. Hang on, let me just check if it's your turn. Is it my turn? Yeah. Oh, thank goodness for that. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I thought we got it wrong there for a second. So the very first record I ever bought when I was eight years old, and I saved up for three weeks of pocket money, um, was the best of ABBA. And I was so over the moon in the last week that uh, ABBA is releasing a new album. There's two songs that have already been released on it. Uh, And they're great. They're ABBA. They're slightly modernized, but still obviously ABBA. Um, and there's a whole album coming out in November and a virtual tour happening that you can buy uh, into, and they're all being digitally remastered so that they're 40 years younger. And I've been over the moon with ABBA, which is probably very sad because you probably hate ABBA, don't you? No, no, oh. absolutely not. I think ABBA is probably the most important uh, pop band that's ever been. The, the, some bands have timeless music, and ABBA is one of them. There is no generation that can ever not like uh, Abba. Well, it's partly their storytelling, and and maybe that's maybe that's why I love them so much and love audio so much. Is a lot of their songs are just stories, and it, it's about you know a man waiting outside on a park bench and waiting for his girlfriend to come out and think he's having an affair, and 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 the whole song is a contained short story. And one of the songs is in this that they really so far is like that. It's a it's a short story, which you haven't quite got the ending of. So I'm not sure if it'll come up in any other songs. Uh, have you listened to them? No, I haven't. I should. Oh, you should. I should give them a listen. They're wonderful. And watch them on YouTube because one of the one of the videos, it's all old footage of them in concerts and places, and some of it's in Australia. But the very end, they go to the technology that's uh, de-aging them because they've actually gone to Lucasfilms Limited and they're wearing special suits. And, I saw pictures of that, yeah. And, they, and they've been de-aged. And so the last minute or so in the film clip is them performing in their new de-aged outfits which they're going to do the virtual tour as i think i need one of those suits <laughs> so it might be ter- it might be terribly vain of them um but yeah so it, my, my little heart has been all happy for the last week or so since That's first awesome. first getting those two songs and i I'm, I'm basically i'm listening to them every day i'm watching them more than i should because um, you look excited That's oh great. I, I adore them i mean <laughs> I, 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 still, I mean i still have every record i mean i have i have every you know vinyl i still got all the original albums from, from my vinyl collection. I still got them all on tape somewhere as well and on CD. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I've got an eclectic taste in music. I love opera. I love musicals. Um, and, yeah, but ABBA was the first band that really captured my heart. And I'm still bitter towards my parents because they wouldn't let me go to the concert when they came out. <laughs> I was nine years old and they wouldn't let me go. And I'm still, I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> but um, maybe one day I'll get over it. But I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to. But at least they can do a virtual tour. I'm going to get to one of their concerts. Um, my parents never had a huge uh, record collection, but 1977, I think, was when Arrival came out. And that they they had Arrival. They, that, I think that was the only ABBA album that they had, which has got uh, songs like Knowing Me, Knowing You and Dancing Queen uh, on it. So that was, that was one of the soundtracks of my young childhood um so it's, yeah, it's, that's also, got a very... it's also got a totally instrumental piece of music and, I, and as a kid i actually learned to start enjoying instrumental music through that album because there's a whole track which is just it's called arrival it's, it's a whole track of just music and I, I and i started to learn to actually love music based on arrival because of that because of that one track yeah. which i used to listen to all the time and I, 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 my, the standout track for me off Arrival is Tiger. That'd be the one. We, I remember I've got very fond childhood memories of the whole family, just, um, you know, my parents uh, looking at us and going, I'm the tiger, you know, and, and singing that song. It was a really, really, really nice memory that I've got. Yeah, I, don't, I, still, I still don't understand that one, but I, it's, a fun, <laughs> it's a fun song, and I think it would make a great big finish story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What about you, um, Dwayne? What are you recommending for us this week? Interesting you've been talking about childhood stuff because I've recently been uh, delving back into my childhood too. I've, I've been out in the back shed and I've been looking for this series of books. I don't know if you can see that. Um, did you ever did you ever see those 
stories. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators. Do you remember yep, them? I do. They were, they were like the the Hardy Boys, but um, the Hardy Boys for me never really. I, I read a, quite a few of them, but they, I never really stayed with them. Um, but Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators, the, probably my fondest memories of uh, those kinds of uh, young boy mystery books. And um, I found on YouTube, I didn't even realise that two of the stories, the very first book and another one of the books, was made into uh, audios. So they were adapted to a cassette, a single cassette. So they're about 50 minutes each story. And I found them on YouTube. So I've been listening to that. Uh, the, the Three Investigators in the Secret of Terror Castle. And you've got Valentine Dial, who's a Doctor Who connection, uh, playing the part of Alfred Hitchcock in the audios which is uh really fantastic the acting's awful absolutely terrible but uh not not valentine dial he's perfect of course um but the 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 boys playing the three investigators aren't very good but uh still it was uh really good to get that uh, on audio a very surprising thing for me too so i've been delving into that anyone who likes alfred hitchcock and the three investigators i'll put some links in the show notes to those audios and you can uh, give them a crack <laughs> I my, wish you I wish you joy of it. <laughs> my sister was a huge Hardy Boy fan of the TV series with Sean Cassidy. Yeah, yeah. And she had she was a huge Sean Cassidy fan, both singing and just heartthrob material. She had posters of him all over her wall. <laughs> uh, good stuff. That'll do us for this uh, for this time. Oh, we've got a, a guest uh, next week joining us. Uh, Benji Clifford's going to be joining us. Oh, the one for Benji, fantastic. So that's going to be great. Make sure you tune back for that. And uh, until then. Catch you later. See you, Philip. See you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll catch you next time. This has been the Sirens of Audio, Episode 74, Randomoid 6, Revenge of the Selectatron, with your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and your favourite podcast app. Find links to all our socials and other info at sirensofaudio.com Be sure that in between you're sending in feedback to us you keep listening to quality audio drama because audio drama Bro!